Hi, it's Tuesday, June the 28th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through the book of Exodus. And today it's Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 to 33. We're going to finish the chapter off. We've been reading in small bits, but this is a big bit that really needs to sort of all hang together. Uh, in this chapter and in the previous chapters, last couple anyway, um, essentially God is giving instructions to the people. God is speaking to Moses, and Moses will communicate with the people, uh, verbally written down, hence scripture that we have here. Um, but God, uh, but Moses will let the people know uh, God's instructions. And so God has given instructions for just about every aspect of life, or at least the building blocks for aspects of life. So in terms of how we worship, when we worship, from uh, sort of regular worship to festivals, we've had things about uh, interpersonal relationships, liability, property, uh, all sorts of stuff. Good material for, for judges, good material for the people. Um, and, uh, well, we've got some more, I guess, instruction. Um, you'll discover, decide for yourself. Whatever it is, God is continuing to speak. It's from that same uh, event, as it were. And uh, let's see what happens. So it's Exodus 23, verses 20 to 33. I am going to send an angel in front of you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Be attentive to him and listen to his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you listen attentively to his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. When my angel goes in front of you and brings you to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I blot them out, you shall not bow down to their gods or worship them or follow their practices, but you shall utterly demolish them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall worship the Lord your God, and I will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. No one shall miscarry or be barren in your land, and I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror in front of you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs on you. And I will send the pestilence in front of you, which shall drive out the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites before you. I will not drive them out before you in one year, or the land will become desolate and the wild animals would multiply against you. Little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possess the land. I will set your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates, for I will hand over to you the inhabitants of the land and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. You shall not live in your land. They shall not live in your land and they will make you sin again. Excuse me. They shall not live in your land, or they will make you sin against me. For if you worship their gods, I will surely be a snare to you. Yeah, I messed up the last line. Um, but I think you got it. So, so much here. Um, and so much that I struggle with. Uh, shall I share my struggles first? Um, I will set your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, or Philistines, and from the wilderness to the Euphrates. The, um, Israel has never been that big. They've never had all of that land. Uh, even in the time of David and Solomon, um, Israel, the, 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 uh, the merged kingdom was not that big. So... So it never happened. Hmm. I struggle with that. Um, God seems to say, stick with me, and you can use me against your enemies. Your enemies. Makes it sound like Israel gets to decide who their enemies are and gets to sort of unleash God on them. That doesn't feel to me like the proper faithful relationship with God. And the whole piece here feels to me kind of like, do what I say and then you can use me. And that's not our relationship with God. That's not Israel's relationship with God. It, it, it sounds to me... It, it's, 
it also sounds very conditional. Hey, let's we we are the people of the faith of Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham that that your your uh, your descendant shall number like the stars or like the sands. Uh, I would give this land to you. Um, there was never, I will give you this if you do these things. And by the way, if you do not do these things, then I am not going to stick with you. I mean, the whole part of covenant is that God covenants with us and, and, and recovenants when we mess up. And the language of this is, yeah, if you mess up, then I'm not going to be on your side. This does not harmonize well with I have chosen you because you are my stiff-necked people. It doesn't fit well with the idea of chosen people. You're just the people who have the opportunity to, to do what I say. And if you do, great. I'll take on your enemies for you. I struggle with this. Uh, I also struggle um, with this idea of God who is quite happy to blot out the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Blot them all out. I struggle with a genocidal God. Uh, now, part of that is because of my faith and what has, what, what has become of my faith because of my experience of Jesus. And that is that we are all wonderfully created. We are all God's children. And the thought that God would blot out a people, I cannot abide that. So I'm stuck with this, this passage and say, well, then I'm just going to ignore it. Well, but it's scripture and it comes from the same scripture that I find life-giving. So just to blot it out, just to ignore it is, is, is difficult. And yet it says essentially that there are people in the world that God doesn't like. And so rather than try to figure them out and incorporate them in creation, God's going to blot them out. I refuse to do in my reading of scripture what it seems to me like God is doing in scripture. And so I'm stuck. It feels to me that the human author of this passage has found a rationale um, for the worst kind of colonialism. I want this land and the people in it can either become like me or I will blot them out. When you get right down to it, that is the worst part of colonialism. And I don't know that I'm prepared to think of good things with colonialism. Um, so it feels that like that to me. So it, it, it feels to me like we're making an excuse. So here is the land. God has promised it to us. We're going to take it. Um, and the reason we're going to take it is because God told us we could take it. Uh, and so, and, and, and God, by the way, said we could not enter into any covenant with them. So we couldn't do this peacefully. Not possible. God told us this was our destiny. God said that they would reside in the land. Yes. Could they not have resided in the land peaceably? I don't know. I know it's not the way of that time. Right? I mean, the reason the Egyptians uh, sort of enslaved and then really wouldn't let the Israelites um, even wander free at all is because they were afraid that they would side with Egypt's with, with Egypt's enemies and that Egypt's enemies would have insiders like the Israelites living in Egypt uh, and therefore could overthrow Egypt. So they were always on their guard. That is the way. Um, Israel didn't make that up. That is the way of the people. They are um, constantly at each other. So I appreciate that in the time, in the place, at each other they were, okay, and so they will find warrant um, in, you know, say, you know, God told us not to go into covenant. Um, God told us we could have that land. And God told us that, yes, slowly but surely, um, we had the right to eliminate our enemies, wipe them out. We had that right. In fact, God would help us. You tell yourself that. 
as I read this. And I may not be right. I, I fully appreciate that. I am not saying this with great authority. I'm speaking about this as a person of faith who cannot understand God, who basically not only counsels, but actually encourages genocide. I, I find I just can't, I, I just don't know how to do that. Um, I, ah, um, so what I find in this though is an invitation for me to wonder about the things that I do that I am convinced God has told me I should do, even if I don't really have reason to believe that. The thing is that it's a thing that I want to do. It's a, it can be a knee-jerk reaction. It could be just something that just fits my agenda. And I will convince myself and others that this is what God wants of me. In this day of highly politicized religion, and I'm not just talking about uh, my friends uh, in the southern part of North America. I talk about my country. I'm talking about countries in Europe. I'm talking about uh, countries in South America. I am talking about people uh, in the middle of the Far East. I'm talking about all sorts of countries where we have um, politicized our religion. Uh, we're very quick to point out that God wants this. God wants this uh, elected official to be in charge. God wants this party to win the election. God wants this person to be in charge of all things. God wants um, the enemies to be eliminated. We say that all the time. I have been in church when we have been told how to vote. Not not a United Church, certainly not a church where I was leading, but churches that I have visited where I have been handed flyers on the way out of the service um, that tell me who to vote for in the next election. Uh, make it very clear what I should do as a faithful person, how they define it. Um, we often use God to, to support what it is we want to do anyway. Israel wandering in the desert. They wanted that land. It was lovely land. There were people already there. Well, we want to get them out. Um, and the easiest way to get them out is to go to battle with them. So we pretty much tell ourselves, yeah, God wouldn't want us to be in covenant with them. <laughs> of course not. No, no. And this is the land God promised us. So of course, what God meant is I'm going to get rid of all those people. So go ahead, get rid of them and know that I'm on your side. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I know it doesn't make sense to lots of other people. So I know that I'm in conflict, but again, it's because I cannot, I, I just don't, I, because of my experience of Jesus, I cannot comprehend a God who says, yeah, yeah, all those people just wipe them out. Because those are God's children as well. I think of the time of Jesus and the God-fearers. So those were the non-Jews who recognized God in Jesus and wanted to be closer uh, actually, they recognize God first, and then they really recognize God in Jesus, but the god fears were before Jesus. So there were people who believed in the God of Abraham who were not Jewish. And, and, and there, I mean, there, there's a temple gate for them in the temple. So God always accepted those people. Well, could they not have been Amorites and Hittites and Perizzites and Canaanites and Hivites and Jebusites? Could they not have been? Could they not also? Here in the text, God seems very concerned, very concerned that the Israelites might be swayed by their gods. What about these people, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites? What about those people being swayed by the God of Abraham? I mean, if you think about what's happened uh, as God helped um, Israel come out of Egypt... There were points in that battle where it was very clear that this wasn't that this had changed. The focus was not freeing Israel; it was also um, punishing the Egyptian gods and rulers, but letting the Egyptian people see that their faith was an empty faith, and and in fact there were those living in Egypt who were not Israelites who came with them on the Exodus, who are now included in this group, not descendants of Jacob, but followers of the God of Abraham. Why is this not afforded the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites? I'll stop saying their names altogether pretty soon. It's just fun. But, but this change 
bothers me. So for me, I hear in this an excuse to take what we want. How often do we use our faith as an excuse to take what we want or to demand because God says? And this happens from, with special interest groups. This happens from the right and the left. It happens all over. The thing that the the fact that this passage bothers me so much um, suggests to me that there's something fundamentally wrong about that, and so it also bothers me when I see it happening around the world today. And I need to spend time looking at how I do it because I'm sure I do it as well from time to time. Take what isn't mine because I want it, and tell myself that well, God would want me to have it. Oh, so that's the big problem that I have, obviously. Um, little pieces that are worth wondering about. Uh, well, uh, so I have heard um, people preach uh, and suggest things. Well, the reason that God wants uh, the Jebusites, I'm going to do it, but I'll do it backwards, okay? Jebusites, Hivites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hittites, and Amorites. The reason God wants them eliminated is that they were so morally corrupt, they were without redemption. Yeah, my problem with that is that's the very thing we say about our enemies in war all the time. Whoever is on the other side of the battle line, we are very quick to disregard their humanity. So whatever it is they do, they do it to the detriment of all humanity. So they are horrible people. In the Second World War, the stories told uh, about, about Germans were not necessarily accurate to, to who the German people were. Um, but it, it, it served its purpose. It, it, it vilified the enemy and made seem like killing them no longer inhumane because they weren't really human. I say that as a student of, of modern history with particular interest in, in the war um, that took place in 1939 to 1945. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a common practice and to me it just feels like we're doing the same thing here and so yeah i uh, i distrust it uh, i did grow up in a time when the stories protestants told about roman catholics and the stories that roman catholics told about protestants particularly in some uh smaller towns um that i that i in which i lived and spent time uh horrific and not true at all, but we dehumanize them. So when I hear people preach that, it feels to me like they're doing the same thing. Uh, because we're trying to figure out why would God be okay with wiping them out? So they, they have the same problem that I have, and they go, well, then it must be because they're immoral. Hmm. I don't find that. That doesn't, doesn't work for me. Um... So let's go back to, to the beginning of the passage too. I'm going to send an angel in front of you to guard you on the way and bring you to the place that I have prepared. What angel are we talking about? Eventually we will have angels with names. Gabriel is an angel that we know of, uh, Michael, but this isn't an angel with a name. Uh, is it a flaming angel that you can see that would have like, I don't know, a sword or, or some descriptions we have of angels where they have six wings and they're covered in eyes. Um, I don't think that's quite right either. Um, this for me feels like the angel, the angel of the Lord who spoke through the burning bush to Moses. This feels to me like that great pillar that leads them through, through uh, out of Egypt and, 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 and into the wilderness. I think what we're talking about here is a presence of God. But again, we don't know how to talk about it. This is a very human experience trying to make sense of things. So there's a sense that God will be present, not necessarily an angel that you can release, they'll go running off, but it's God's presence that will guard us and, and, and bring us to the place that we have prepared. So that's the other thing too, is we're not meant to stay in the wilderness. We are going a place. Be attentive and listen to him and to his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. Again, doesn't sound like an angel. Angels don't have the power to pardon or not pardon. 
um, for my name is in him. I have heard it preached that this indeed is Jesus. Right? Be attentive to him. Listen to his voice. My name is in him. Uh, he will not pardon your transgression. Well, Jesus does pardon people and heal people. And Jesus does speak for as God. And because of our concept of Trinity, they are one to say that I am in him. That works for many people. And they go, well, there you go. So so this is this is Jesus. And this is what, what we're hearing here is it's you better follow Jesus. And if you don't follow Jesus, then you don't get all of that. And I have heard people preach and say, so the reason that Israel isn't as big as it could be here is because they rejected Jesus. It doesn't work for me, personally. It doesn't work for me. Um, this text stood for centuries and centuries and stands to this day for Jews who don't think that this is Jesus. It doesn't say that it's Jesus. I am a little more comfortable with those who think of it as the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Wisdom, or Ruah, all concepts um, that you can find in the Hebrew Scriptures and, and can work now. So there's this idea that this, there, is, there is my spirit. Again, can't contain God. How do we talk about God? Well, we talk about God's spirit. We talk about uh, an angel, God's presence. That makes some sense for me. But I will run into the same problem because, again, it would suggest that God's intent is genocide. Also, we have the promise, um, you shall worship the Lord your God, and I will bless your bread and your water. I will take sickness away from you. No one shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. So everyone's going to live as long as they're supposed to live, like good long lives, no miscarriages, no sickness, all of that promise. Again, it didn't happen because the people weren't faithful enough or because the text is written with a certain exuberant joy where daddy's going to give me everything I ever wanted. Which, of course, isn't true, but it's a feeling. And it, and, and it speaks more to how, to the regard in which I hold the one that I call daddy. Uh, the regard in which I hold that one. Oh my God, they are so great that they can and will do anything. They haven't necessarily promised it. It is a sense of my regard. When I was a child, I thought my father could probably fly because he could do everything. He was as strong as Superman in my mind. I knew that for sure. And the day that I found five $20 bills on, the, on his dressing table, what I was doing going across my father's dressing table is, we won't worry about that. Um, but I believe I was six years old and I thought my father is the richest man in the world. Never seen such money. And I would have told people, my, my daddy, uh, is the richest person in the world and the strongest. It's because I held my father in such great regard, not because my father ever said to me, son, I am the strongest and I am the richest man in the world. For me, this is about us projecting on God and, uh, and, and our regard for God. When I say our, I'm talking about the author of this, of this text. I'm talking about the people who believe that God loves them so much, well then of course God is giving them everything and they'll never have a bad thing happen to them again. I have come to know God in Jesus and I am reminded, by the way, the Hebrew scriptures do it too, but I need to be reminded as Jesus remind me that today has enough worries for today, so don't worry about tomorrow. There are worries in life. There are worries in faith. Uh, I see Jesus go to the cross, and I am reminded that a life of faith is not free of difficulty or struggle. So I take that, and I come to this passage and go, yeah, this is people talking about themselves aspirationally. This is people talking about how great God is and knowing that God loves them. Well, this must be what it looks like. We get everything we've ever wanted, and there'll never be another miscarriage and no sickness. This for me isn't God's promise. This is how we imagine God in our own infancy. Anyway, I'm going to leave it with you to see what you think of it. Um, 
you may have a different take on this entirely. You may feel I'm completely off the mark, and that's good. We're meant to wonder about it, particularly when the text is difficult. And I will point out, by the way, that in my denomination, United Church of Canada, I have never heard anybody preach this text. Not once. Most of my friends avoid it. I don't believe it comes up in the common lectionary either um, because it's problematical. But sometimes problematical is just an awesome invita uh, invitation. And with that, let me offer a prayer. Loving God, thank you for challenging texts. Thank you for the things that just don't resolve right away because they engage us, God. They encourage us to push harder, to wonder more, to bring our minds, our hearts, and our imaginations to, to the moment. And in that, try to discern what it is that you are truly saying. We may not agree always, God, but in doing this, we have the best chance of truly hearing you. May today be such a day. May we hear you. We pray through the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, another tricky day. Um, I wish you... I wish you a wonderful rest of the day. I hope your wondering brings you peace and insight. And I hope you know that uh, regardless of how you feel about this passage, regardless of whether you find a place that it resolves or you're still left in tension, that God sees you and understands exactly where you are in this and, and loves you. And, and that God's love moves through you and out into the world in ways you can barely imagine. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.